Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Generation S podcast. And as it were, our first video episode of Generation S. And I have, to me, the perfect guest for the first ever video edition of the show. So a while back, you may have listened to an episode we did where we talked all about one of my favorite book series, which was Goosebumps. And we talked all about the great stories. Uh, but one of the things we really touched on in that episode was the artwork. Uh, it's terrific. It's very evocative. And oftentimes, I'll be honest with you, I, I thought it was... I thought it was a photograph. Um, and so I am so excited to be able to present my guest for you today. Uh, so R.L. Stein, you know, is the writer, but the illustrator, just as important when it comes to any books, because the illustrations really put you in the right headspace for any book that you're reading. So I am so happy to introduce my guest for today, Mr. Tim Jacobus. He is best known as the illustrator for how many how many books is it? How many Goosebumps books have you illustrated, Tim? Uh more than a hundred, a hundred and fifteen, maybe. Wow. Nobody, nobody knows for sure. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought I had a number, and then every once in a while, you'll be out there on the web, or somebody will send over a book cover and go, "Oh, what about this one?" And I'll go, "Oh, that's right, I forgot about that." Yeah. So, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, it's a hundred plus. That's oh a nice gosh. number. Yeah. Well, 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 again, Tim, welcome to the show. Uh, super excited to chat with you. I know um, me personally, I mean, one of the aspects of, of the Goosebumps books, as I mentioned, was the artwork and how great it was and how evocative it was. And you've done a lot of them. And I did have this question kind of up front because I, I honestly didn't know the answer to this. But um, the original artwork for, for most of those books, I know that's all you. But what about a lot of these reprints where they have totally different cover art? Are you involved in those as well? Or is that a, a separate group that's handling that at this point? Yeah, that's a that's a separate uh, individual who's doing those. Okay. Uh, I did Goosebumps. The uh, very first one was uh, in 1992, yep. Welcome to Dead House. And that was uh, July of 92. So this year is our 30th anniversary. And uh, I did them for uh, about 12 years okay. uh, nonstop. And uh, at that point, Goosebumps stopped for a little while. It, it was a couple of years where they, they weren't putting them out. And then when they restarted them, they hooked them got hooked up with another artist and he took over from there. Okay. Uh, it wasn't that there was any animosity or bad blood or anything like that. It was just, I had, I had run the, run the show for 12 years and got a yeah. hundred of them under my belt. It was, uh, they, they needed a, a new set of packaging and, uh, and they got somebody else who, uh, a very talented guy. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I thought it was great. I, I didn't, it felt different to me though. And that's why I wanted to kind of confirm. Yeah, that's, has... I mean, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, yep. They, from a marketing standpoint, if you're, you run them for that long, um, you know, so you're now the, the way younger brother and your older brother's gone off to college and you see his goosebumps book, they want to repackage them so that you can identify with them and yeah. make them your own. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a way to cycle the material and get a new group of kids interested in it. Well, and that's gotta be the thing, right? Because for you, I mean, I'm sure you obviously had other sources for inspiration for your artwork in general, but I mean, you were, you were kind of trailblazing those. So yeah, if someone's coming in and saying, okay, well, you got to draw another light of the night of the living dummy cover you're like well okay i can either look at tim's and go well i don't want to do so you're either working really hard not to do it or you're trying to incorporate that in and so yeah i, I can't imagine that they didn't a, have their work cut I, out for you them. know on on some level that's a that's a harder task yeah uh you know i i went into it with it with nobody had any expectations what i was gonna do it yeah. was everything's a clean slate and uh so yeah i that uh, it's not something well, I'm going to flip that. He did have a very tough job. But uh, as an illustrator over the years, we've all had opportunities to redo stuff that's been done in the past. Yep. Uh, they re-released the classics from time to time. And uh, I remember being able to do uh, a, a new cover for uh, The Invisible Man. Yep. Um, I also did one for the House of the Seven Gables. Oh, wow. OK. Um, yeah. So they come up and you get those opportunities. So um, it's it's a it's a challenge 
and it's cool because you get to put your own personal spin on, yeah. you know, some of these classic stories. Well, and I think of it like in more modern times, like you think of like the comic books, right? I don't know if you're a big Marvel or DC comic sure. reader, but like, you know, you've got Spider-Man was drawn by what, Steve Ditko for so many years. I forget who took over right after him. I don't know if it was, it was um, Todd McFarlane or whoever, but whoever had to draw Spider-Man after Ditko was done was like, OK, I'm I can either make this my own and, and the fans are going to hate it or I can be a direct copycat and nobody will know. But then I feel like I'm kind of selling myself short. And so, yeah, it's you know, I, I agree. As long as you have the right headset to or mindset, whatever, to to say, I'm going to make this my own, but I'm still going to respect the legacy of, of what came before it. Um, yeah, I think you're uh, probably good to go. You're absolutely right. Comic books have been doing it uh, more consistently and maybe more effectively for all these years because – uh, you know, again, there's Spider-Man, Batman, Superman have all been around and yep. they keep reinventing the wheel and reinventing the wheel. And, you know, the costumes evolve and, you know, it, it, it does take on a life of its own and it's kind of cool. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but to your point, uh, as the, the, you know, the follow up artist, it's, it's your job to be very knowledgeable of what happened before you. You can't yeah. just show up and go, yeah, wow, well, I'm, I'm just going to do it my way. Uh, that's a good way to make a whole lot of new enemies. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and primarily the fan base, I think. That's is, exactly it. That's what I you mean. Know? And, yeah. and they will let you know quickly. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, man. Well, listen, let's take you back over 30 years then. So, um, you know, prior to Goosebumps, I know you had gotten your first big break with um, a totally non-related, a non-horror book, actually. I, I had my chance to do my research on this here. It was called The Great Thirst. And it was, it was, uh, you did the cover for that. And it was nothing to do with horror at all, right? It was, it was all, no. it was, uh, tell me it about a, that. Yeah, it was a novel. Uh, the the setting was in uh, in Africa. The the cover art really was just making a setting. You know, it was a whole story of, you know, a, a human interest story. But, you know, the uh, art director wanted to have this watering hole that where there was this, you know, obviously a drought scenario. And the idea behind it is every kind of animal was at this watering hole, but they weren't um, they had all learned that this is the only source of water. And instead of it being a very tense thing, he wanted it to be this very peaceful, relaxed, everybody's yeah. together. Yeah, there's a water shortage, but you know, the, the lions can be right next to the zebras and everybody can, uh, there was enough for everybody. Yeah. Um, if so again, I, I know how to draw animals and I know a little bit about Africa and, but it was a, it was a challenge to do all the research and get all the animals to look right. And every time I would bring in the sketch, you know, we work on it for quite a while because it was my first job and he wanted to do something specific. Every time I brought it in, he'd be like, Oh yeah, that's starting to really look good. I want more animals. Yeah. All right. And then I put some more in and, you know, go home and come back again. And yeah, yeah, that's great. Can we, get some more in there so it was this ever increasing amount of wildlife that uh, ended up in the piece now uh all the art in the early days you know from um the uh, i'm not sure you probably you might even know better than me what year that was that the great thirst came along but so we're in the mid you know mid that was 80 was 85 i think i saw yeah mid, okay yeah. 85 mid 80s from yep. the mid 80s until about 2005 digital art was a you know it was something that was talked about but you didn't you know, nobody had it going on at home you know no. you had to be somewhere or work for somebody so art was art and uh, so all of the, uh, uh, the original cover work that I did was acrylic paintings. Okay. And I worked big. So that particular piece, uh, you know, um, it's probably, it's probably, so 2020, it's probably 30 uh, by 15. It might even oh, be wow. bigger. It's a, it's a big piece. Well, that gets so, you the chance to do the details and you get exactly. right in there. And yeah, you, you always want to work a little larger where you're comfortable and you, you don't you don't need to work with eye loops on to get the right. detail in there. And you always want it to be so that when they reduce it down, it really gets nice and tight on yep. the, the book cover. 
And uh, yeah, it was just, and a, a lot of times I let the standard size of the illustration board dictate what the, you know, uh, what the size was going to be. Um, yep. Goosebumps book covers were 20 by 20 because they wanted a square format. Oh, because you had the, the titling on the top. Right, and so exactly. you had to fit so both. We were, yep. we were putting it in a square and sticking it in a window. But uh, 20, uh, 30, 40 was the standard giant piece of illustration board. So I would cut it in half. So now I got a 20, 30. Then I'd cut the 10 inches off the top. And there's my 20, 20. And I'd get two out of a out of a sheet. And yep. uh, it was the least amount of cuts that I had to do. Yeah. So it's board size, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's like buying plywood. You're going to cut it a certain way just because that's what they gave you to start with. So when you're, when you're painting, I mean, so you're using acrylic paints. Are you on straight canvas or are you using some kind of a paper or poster board? So or? this stuff is called illustration. Illustration board okay. uh, it was put out by a company, Bainbridge. Uh, I used a number 80 illustration board. And so instead of having a plate finish, it smooth finish, it had a little bit of a tooth to it. Okay. Not, you know, not real rigid, not canvassy, yeah. but enough to where a, a, the tooth surface actually pulls the paint off the brush. Where okay. if you have a plate finish, as fast as you put it on your next stroke, actually kind of lifts it back off again yeah so this tooth would uh grab the paint and let it sit in there and um uh yeah it was just a surface that i really learned to enjoy um and i didn't have to do anything to it uh what i did for a while was paint on masonite okay and you would get it from the you know go over to lowe's or home depot and it would come in four by eight foot sheets and you'd cut it the size you want, but then you'd get, uh, you'd have to seal it uh, with the, what's called gesso, which is a, a white chalky base paint that, okay. uh, you know, they use to prep it. And it, what it does is seal up all the pores. So yep. now you're, you're doing house painting on this board. And then yeah. inevitably there's, you know, there's brush strokes. So now you're sanding it to get it to the finish you want. And then you put another coat on that's a little more watered down. And I would work for, you know, maybe an hour and a half to get exactly what was coming. That number 80 board was, yeah. just, you know, like take it, it was already shelf, prepped almost. ready to go. No yeah. prep, no anything, just start. So uh, yep. Yeah, I got away. Uh, although I, I, I still paint on Masonite now. Um, usually when I'm painting, I'm painting strictly for fun. And, you know, the the idea of hurry up, let's go isn't isn't part of the scenario at that point. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, the uh, one of the things I had listened to some previous interviews just to kind of get a feel for, you know, how I want to drive the conversation today. And one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, Doing good work is important, but doing hitting deadlines is even more important. Oh, and so absolutely! You you have that kind of that added stress of like, okay, I got to make sure that uh, you know not only does it have to look pretty good, I got to get it done by Thursday or whatever it was. And I think you mentioned actually, um, and I thought this was pretty cool. You were doing at one point like four a month as far as Goosebumps covers, right? Like one a week, basically. I was doing I was doing four illustrations a month. Not all of them were uh, generally for Goosebumps. So you had one every month. Yeah, so, you know that was that was the speed that R. L. Stein was writing, yep. and then maybe there would be a special edition. But I was also doing other series at the same time. So yes, I yep. was. You know, the the one a week was kind of what we want. That was optimum. That was you were staying very busy, yeah. but you also were getting a good night's sleep, and you could get up the next morning. But it was, you know, it was. Ding, time to go, paint all the way until dinner. Yeah. Okay, quick, get a rest, do this again tomorrow. You know, don't fool around because if you're fooling around, you got those hours have to be made up somewhere. So, yeah, it was a, you know, um, I, I I hate to say it was a grind because it wasn't a grind. We all have had jobs where it's a grind. Yep. And, you know, uh, I had the the luxury of being able to sit and paint for a living. But um, no matter what it is, I, I'm sure, you know, uh, a professional baseball player come October and you're not in the hunt for a, a playoff, you're getting sick of it. You know, yeah. you're, you're ready to be done and let's go do something else for a little bit. So yep. whenever you do the same thing over and over, there is a, there's a little uh, tedium to it. But, it, you know, the basic overall 
you know, creating paintings is still, I've been doing it a long time and it's still yeah. fun. You know, I still get excited. I still, it still makes me smile. So, um, yeah, I'm very lucky to be able to do stuff like this. Yeah, no, man, I think that's, it's just terrific. And, um, so question for you, well, two, there's a two parter. Well, it's not really, it's two separate questions. Um, the first question is you mentioned acrylic and, and I got it because when I look at your illustrations for goosebumps in particular, um, I see a lot of detail in there and, and painting I've, I've painted with acrylic. I'm not very good at it, but I've, I've painted, I've messed around with it a little bit. I know I, I'm not great at getting finer details and I'm also not painting on a 20 by 20, but are you using any other paints for, for, for that particular artwork or is it still acrylic at this point or was it for, for most of those? Yeah, it was uh, always acrylic. Okay. Uh, I used um, uh, sable brushes, uh, and I also used an airbrush. Okay. Now, the airbrush is what gave it that real polished digital. Almost photographic. That's what I was yeah, wondering, because a lot of these pictures look like photographs in a way. Yeah, it's a very, it smooths things out. So uh, when I first started, you know, again, airbrush was a huge thing in the 80s. Started in the 70s. It was big in the 80s. And people were doing it to do uh, artwork on cars, uh, gas tanks, uh, all yep. that stuff. And that's where we all got introduced to it. Uh, I, I did some some of that stuff early, early on. And um, so that's where I kind of got the gist of how the thing worked. And then once I got into art school, I was like, oh, this thing does cool stuff. Let me start to bring it in to, uh, you know, other other styles. And, yeah, uh, yeah. so I would say it's 80, you know, a, a typical Goosebumps painting or any of the artwork I was doing back then was 80 to 85 percent brush. But yeah. then I'd be always constantly going in with that airbrush and going, all right, hide those brush strokes, smooth that out. Or, yeah. you know, the background, I would blow the whole background in and give it that nice slick, you know, sky, everything's blended real nice. And yep. then go back in and start working the brush stuff again. So when you finish the painting, let's say, I mean, you said it took you about a week. If you were if you were nine to five and it maybe a little yeah. over time, about a week. Yep. What's next? You ship it over to the publishing company. They take a picture of it. How does that work exactly? Yeah. Uh, so first thing you do is you hop in the car and you got to get over to Federal Express before they close at nine o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now, and they close at nine. Oh, now, yeah. The first thing you do is make friends over at Federal Express. OK. And let them know what you're doing. And then I, I would be there all the time and I'd be there at, you know, 8.55, eight, you know, I'd be cutting it close. And they're out. so the conversation starts with, well, what the hell are you doing? You know, yeah. <laughs> what what is this all about? So then I explained what I was doing and then I made friends and they're like, oh, that's cool. All right. Here's what you do when you come to the door. And if you get here too late, they lock the door and then yeah. they pretend they don't see you. Oh, yeah. So the guy goes, come around, get in your car and drive around back. Because the, the garage doors, those aren't closed yet. They don't okay. close for another 20 minutes or a half an hour. And come in. And we know who you are. So you can come in through the through the garage doors and get this thing in there. Nice. So, never had to do it. Never had a slide underneath the garage right. door. Now always made it in time. So get it to them. They would overnight it. So it would be to the the art director that following morning by 10 o'clock. Yeah, they would take a look at it. If they thought that everything was cool, then they would take it. You were right. There's a specific photographer who did nothing but shoot artwork for publishers that was camera ready. So they had a special room and a yeah. special easel to set it up. Now, my stuff was real easy because okay. it's very smooth. It was very slick. Yeah, it's wasn't acrylic. glossy though, was it? Yeah, was it, it's acrylic yeah. and very matte finish to the whole thing. Yep. There were guys who were doing oil painting with big broad strokes that were raised up, and they had to make sure that you know they didn't get the reflections or the the cast shadows, shadows or, here yeah. in the different. So uh, you know, this person who was doing it had tons and tons of skill. Um, but like I said, my stuff was pretty much here. Stick it right there. The light's fine. This is going to be good. Yep. And they would shoot with a eight by ten uh, Hasselblad camera, and it would take these big giant. What looked like, remember 
the one inch by one inch slide that you would put in a slide projector. Oh yeah. Well, these would come out eight by ten. Okay. So they were big, beautiful, and you'd hold them up to the light, and they were gorgeous because the you know the light would shine through and the, the colors would pop. But that's what they would use to do their color separations. They would use those transparencies to get the gotcha. stuff done. But, okay. So you can see when the digital world came along and you could cut all that shit out yeah. that got the that got the publishers very 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 excited that was yeah. a whole step of things that they didn't have to deal with i wasn't running to the federal express guy they didn't have to get it to the photographer they didn't have to do the separations it was already you You're know just emailing a png or whatever it is yeah i'm yeah. delivering tamra ready art as soon yeah. as you open up your email there it is there it is i when it's, i wouldn't even touch on that cuz i wanted to mention it too is like from a, you said earlier how you were researching what animals looked like and whatnot because and people don't think about it like now like if I want to draw a picture of a moose I'll just go on Google and I'll pull up a picture of a moose <laughs> yeah and and, I, and we're rocking and rolling whereas yeah. you know you maybe go to the library or you know look up some National Geographic to see okay if they're going to be sitting here in the Sahara what's the light looking like you know what I mean so um, I don't think people understand and appreciate that and then not only that but furthermore with digital art the fact that you know. You have the luxury of like I was because I I'm you know I think my listeners know this I make all my own artwork for my my podcast it's nothing crazy but I'll like I'll sketch stuff out and I'll I'll impose it onto my my uh, my phone and I edit all my pictures on my phone and I'm pinching and I'm zooming in and I'm like let's just give a little more shading here like you couldn't do any of that back then and so so Tim I know as far as you know early in your career you mentioned acrylic paint that really was your go to medium but then you know digital art came into the into the fray in the in the mid two thousands, which I, I guess that's kind of technically after the heyday of, of goosebumps, as it were, as far as you know your yes. your role with it. Um, so what do you, I mean? Do you? I guess let me back up. So any any work you do now, are do you do anything acrylic still professionally, or is it all digital at this point? Uh, if we're doing something, anything that's commercial, anything that's going into production. It's just not worth anybody's while for me to yeah. create a acrylic painting. If yeah. you're hiring me to create a nice piece of art that you want to do nothing but hang on your wall, yeah, sure, we can do different. that. But yeah. so uh, again, from everybody's perspective, if, if it's going into production, it's just so much easier and so much better for everybody uh, yeah. to do it digital. Now, and, yeah. Now, when digital came along. It was not a, this was not a seamless, smooth transition. Yeah. You know, I had been doing paintings for almost 20 years at that point. I had figured out exactly how, you know, what consistency the the acrylics in the jar and water needed to be to push it through the airbrush and what, you know, the whole thing was a, you know, it was it's a craft. A, it's your craft. Uh, yeah. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a martial art kata, you know, it was, <laughs> it was its own life source. Yeah. And uh, then they were like, all right, you got to switch over. And they gave us a little time, but they said that there would be a legitimate cutoff point where we are not accepting any more traditional art after this point. Yeah. And uh, it was just, it was awful, you know, because I, I had stopped, you know, I didn't really learn to type when I was in school, you know, like a keyboard, the whole thing. And you got to remember, you know, I bought a good computer, but a good computer didn't have hardly any RAM, hardly any storage, hardly yeah. any, you know, no memory, no, no anything. It was just, you know, it was good for its day. And Photoshop was still, you know, I got the first version that had layers. Oh, Yo, yeah. You know, that was a thrill. So uh, the start was rough. It was, it, there was nothing fun about it. Uh, yeah. There was lots of frustration. Uh, I, you know, I don't mind tools, you know, I, I'm not a, it, it's not that I'm not a tool guy and I, you know how to, you know, troubleshoot and stuff like that, but I was way, way over my head. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, to say I hated it would be quite an <laughs> understatement, but yeah. you know, you, you, the first part of it is you got to get over, you know, like you're learning something new and 
that's you know it's it's a little humbling you know yeah oh from, yeah you're going from i'm really good at this thing to holy shit i'm i am terrible <laughs> like I'm, I'm i am you know there's a kid you know over in third grade at the elementary school who yeah. can do this better than me right now yeah and uh so yeah it you know so you get a little farther down the road and you go okay that, I, I got that. This is starting to work. Oh, now I understand that. And the, the, what's, you know, the, you hit on a whole bunch of things early on. It's so much easier for everything now. If yeah. you're doing Photoshop and you don't know what you're doing, you can just pull up a YouTube video and there's a hundred people who yep. are incredibly good at it, who will answer the same question 12 different ways to, to get you where you need to be. That didn't exist. There, nobody knew, and you would spend a week on a problem just hitting your head against the wall because you couldn't call anybody because nobody else was doing it at the time. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it was a, it was, you know, it was frustration, but, again, that's a good way to learn. You know, the, okay, we're going to throw you in the deep end of the pool, and yeah. if you don't swim to the edge you're going to drown and that's you know that's it that those you, you adapt or die right that's, that's the it. old that's the old saying or whatever so well there it is man so so you switch to digital because i know i mean i've seen I, i've never messed around with again i told you i was doing artwork on my phone but like i've seen like the drawing pads with the stylus is and i think i even one time bought my mother-in-law because she has like an ipad i bought her like an actual like it was a stylus paintbrush where like you could actually paint yeah. brush strokes i mean it's wild what you can do um and the but, tools yeah, keep getting better. And that's what it is. Like, yeah. But back in the day, that was not the case. I mean, Microsoft Paint was a standard for art for people. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you know, when you're saying, well, well shit, I can, I can do this in acrylic and it'll look 12 times better than what you're doing right now. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? But, but again, you know, you fast forward five, 10 years, all of a sudden you've got people that are, you know, doing all this crazy art and yeah, you gotta, you gotta get with the times because that's what you're, you know, you're, you know, you're whoever you're working for is going to want. That's what they want it faster. They want it better. And they want it. You so know? what ends up happening though is, uh, you know, so it starts out that you, you know how to do something traditional. Then they tell you, okay, that's a liability traditional is a liability we need you to do this new thing yep. and okay so now that's a liability so you learn the new technology and you you go okay i got an asset here i i can do this new digital thing and then everybody's kind of doing that digital thing and it's like well what am i going to do to set me apart from yep. what everybody else is doing oh wait a minute this old liability is now a new asset and i can do all kinds of stuff that all of you can't do because I put in my 40,000 hours yeah. over the years doing it this way. Now I can bring some tricks in and add them. So it's this back and forth between the traditional world and the digital world. And uh, my artwork now ha is a, it has a homogenous feel to it because yeah. it starts outside the computer. It always starts outside the computer. Yeah. It's pencil drawings on paper, sitting on a hard desk, with yep. regular light, and I am looking down at what I'm drawing. Eventually, it'll get into the digital world where the pen is here, but I'm looking up here, and you figure out how to do that. That's a that's a tough one right there. That yeah. simple act was uh, that was that was months and months and months before you went. Oh, okay, I don't have to look at it to make it work. That's yeah. I was gonna say I can't imagine because again, like when I'm doodling on my phone, I'm still using my finger and seeing where the line going where yeah god if you're looking down at a pad and seeing okay well it's going up there that's well oh, that's that's got to throw you off man it's like what's that phantom limb syndrome or whatever like you feel like your hand's still there like it's yeah, doing yeah. something I, I, and you, <laughs> i don't know what it i think that's what it is where you're uh, yeah, doing it, something <laughs> yeah your brain I, thinks it needs to be there and yeah so when you're doing, so you started off, you know, you're starting off with pencil. Are, are you scanning that in then? Or are you, are you kind of tracing oh, through yeah, it or so, how does yeah, that work? Exactly. I, 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 I do all the pencil work. I'll do some shading on it. I'll get it all the way I want it. Once my idea is now solidified, that's when it gets scanned in. Then when, you know, so the, the color work is where that, that's where the, the digital world the digital. starts to take over, Yep. which is then, you know, which is great because now you're using layers. And if you turn the piece in and in the old days, uh, if it was a 
painted piece of art and they went, yeah, yeah, well, that's great. But uh, we were kind of hoping that the background would be a little greener. Uh, yeah. yeah, I could do that. But that's, you know, you got to ship it back. Then it's going to take yeah. me a whole day that I'm going to ship it back to you. Where yeah. While we're talking on the phone, I can adjust that layer and go, how about this no, how one? About, how like, about like that? Let me share my screen greener? real quick. Sure. Yeah. It's a little greener. So, <laughs> yeah. um no, yeah, it's, it's super, massive. super convenient. Yeah. So, well, listen, let's let's go back again. Let's let's okay. cause again. I, I feel like a lot of my listeners are wanting to know goosebumps. So I want I want you to talk me through your process here. So um, I know I know for a fact that you didn't get like a full synopsis of a story, but talk me through start to finish. OK, Mr. Stein, I don't know him personally, so I can't call him RL. Mr. Stein comes to you and says, listen, Tim, I've got, uh, I've got, I've got a new story for you, but, but actually, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm going to back up before that. How did you guys get connected to begin with? I don't even, I don't know this part. Yeah. So uh, it's, um, uh, it's kind of a luck scenario. So okay. RL, uh, is a very well-established, uh, author at this point. He's been writing for a, quite a while. He's got fear street is running, you know, all the, you know, all the pistons are firing and he's got a real solid thing going there. Yep. And they come up with this idea for doing a horror series for kids seven to 11. And this is a market that's never been tapped. Yep. And there's a, you know, there's tons of apprehension, you know, will this go, uh, will it be too scary? Is there even a market? Because uh, in that age group at that time, there was no boys. They, they weren't, they weren't interested in books, the books that were being put out there. There just wasn't a demographic for them. It was only girls who were reading in that age group. So not that goosebumps was first. uh, It was first aimed at girls because that was the market. Yeah. So, you know, RL, when he, you know, I, I found this out, in you know recent years not at the time he wasn't thrilled about it uh they reached out to me and said listen we have this series we're not even sure it's going anywhere you know you got any you know i know you're not busy right now you know because i work with the same art directors on other projects and they're like we think you would be a good fit for this um there's going to be four books uh maybe you know take a look at this and maybe we'll give it a try uh I looked at it and I went, oh, yeah, this is this is fun. I'll do it. And they yeah. weren't even paying the full, you know, like there was a market price. Sure, and sure. They, they cut the market price because they were going, yeah, this is this thing's probably not going anywhere. So yeah. I, I looked at it and said, nah, this is fun. Who can, yeah. you know, never did anything like this. Yeah. Horror kid stuff. All right. I could do this. I was going to say, had you done any horror illustrations before no, this? I had done, you know, sci-fi. I had done fantasy. So I had, you know, there were once in a while, there might've been a monster in there or yeah. some sort of drama, but no, the horror, you know, definitely not, not your, your typical horror stuff. I had done, you know, uh, murder mysteries and, so no, this was a this was a this a this brand new a avenue to go down. Yeah, it was a okay. deviation. It was a nice you know, and so did the first one. And uh, the other part of the story is they weren't sure if I was the guy or if they should do a more traditional horror illustrator. Okay. So I did book number one, Welcome to Dead House. Yep. And another artist named Jim Thiessen did book number two, which is Stay Out of the Basement. Now, yep. Jim was a very accomplished, is a very accomplished illustrator, uh, very talented guy, had done horror, uh, had some horror in his background. And uh, they said, OK, you guys just do your thing and we'll decide after we see the first two covers, you know, fully flushed out and uh, whoever wins will uh, get to do the other couple of books. So yeah. it wasn't like there was a, you know, it wasn't a competition or it wasn't a, anything. It was just, all right, you know, getting two more books would be nice. But I, also I was staying busy enough. You know, I was getting work. So I knew if this fell through, something else was going to pop up. Sure. It wasn't like, you know, we weren't clawing for this last piece of bread on the table. Right. So 
I did my piece, he did his. And uh, what ended up happening is because that fear factor of it being too scary was still in everybody's mind, my art had lots more color in it. Jim's was more traditional horror, had that muted color thing, yeah. which, again, a little bit more realistic. And uh, they looked at mine and said, ah, you know what? This is probably the way to go. This is a way to soften up the horror, you know, edge to this thing. And yeah. uh, let's just let them do these. Okay. So, uh, so did you redo Stay Out of the Basement or did they I, end up I using did, his? Yes, down the road. Not, okay. Not immediately. Um, I, there was two books. So I did the, the whole first series, 62 books, yep. except for two of them. One was the one that Jim did. And the other one, I think I was away, you know, I went away on like an anniversary, you know, trip with my ex-wife. And okay. they said, ah, you know, we'll just have somebody you pick it up. You know, again, this was all, nobody was thinking about history or yeah. anything like that. Anyway, we get to the end of the series and, you know, we were done for a little while. And then one of the art directors from Scholastic called me back and said, hey, you know, you did them all except for these two, right? I said, yeah. And I said, you know, and I rehashed the story I just told you. Yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, you know what? Let's let's get you to redo those so that, you know, you can have – you can say I did them all. You did them all, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh, heck yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, in uh, 2003, maybe, or early 2000s, they let me go back and, and redo those. So there are versions out there of stay out of the basement and be careful what you wish for that I did. So that's a very long way for me to say, yeah, yeah, I did them all. Yeah. So, all right. But, well, there it is. Um, so I do this and uh, – I. To be perfectly honest, I don't even really know who R.L. Stein is. I don't know yeah. his history. I'm not, you know, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box. It <laughs> takes me a while to catch on and go, oh, shit, you know, this yeah. guy is something. <laughs> and uh, Well, he uh, wasn't really that well known at the time, though, right? He wasn't... No, but he had been around a long time and produced tons of stuff. Like, okay. I should have known because I was in the business long enough. I should have known something. Gotcha. Yeah. But again... No way to Google anybody and find well, out that's who anybody the thing. is. So. Yeah, you can't look him up on Facebook and look at his posts. <laughs> you know, it's, well, okay, maybe i got to find a magazine article where he yeah. puts something in or whatever. So we start working together, and uh, we don't – they don't put authors and illustrators together. Okay. They keep, a, they keep this apart for a, a, a number of reasons. Um, most of it is they keep control over it. Authors work with editors, illustrators work with art directors, art directors and editors talk. So there's a, there's a big gap between us. Yeah. Um, we were probably doing goosebumps for two years before I ever shook his hand. Really? Like you did, yeah. had you talked to him on the phone or anything no, or no? Wow. No. Yeah. No, it, it's, that's how, how much distance they put between you. Jeez. Um, so, uh, yeah, he would give me uh, Welcome to Dead House. I got a decent amount. I think I got like a whole chapter uh, okay. to read. So I had a real essence for what that one was about. Yep. As we move forward, I got less. And then okay. get to the next one, and I got less. And I would get less to the point where it was, here's the title, and here's two sentences. Oh, uh, wow. That, uh, but to be perfectly honest with you, the – uh, the less is better. Okay. Um, does it give you, you more freedom to do what you want yes, or how does, okay. Because if you give me, if, you know, it's my job to, to project what the author's trying to convey. It's my, you know, and if you give me five chapters and there's tons of detail, I am compelled to put as much of that in there as I can to get yeah. your vision across. Now, if you only give me a little bit, now I got to depend on me to go, all right, well, where are we going to take this thing? And yeah. you can't get mad at me because I, you know, I had no other information. So yeah. uh, I would just run down the field and make stuff up. And most of the time it worked. 
Uh, you know, yeah. I wasn't so far off that they had to go, you know, no, you're totally wrong here. You know, we're not in the desert. It's an ocean and they're supposed to be, on, you know, like was never any of those scenarios. Yeah. Occasionally, uh, um, uh, Camp Jelly Jam, I had small cabins in the background and they're going, no, they're, they're, they're multiple story dormitory style buildings. Okay. Gotcha. We just change the background a little bit. So always just minor little tweaks here and there. And uh, no, I got a, I really got a chance to just do what I wanted. And that's yeah. not typical. Okay. And so, so you do all these illustrations and then, you know, you're sending them back to your art director who's interacting with the editors. You go, these are great. Okay. We're cooking. We're, 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 you know, we're cooking with gas now. You're firing in all cylinders. So the books, let, you know, let's fast forward. How, 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 okay. Well, how, how long after you started like with Welcome to Dead House did that see store shelves and you saw, oh, shit, there's my work of art right there? Uh, so, um, we, we get going. And so they go, okay, Tim, you're going to do the the next two. And then when we got to the, they're going to, they go, all right, we're going to do a couple more. It's still not doing great. Um, they were, there was talk um, around book six, book seven about maybe canceling it because it really wasn't getting, tra it wasn't doing horrible, but it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't really going anywhere. Yeah. And then around book nine, for nobody can put their finger on it other than the word of mouth was starting to build with kids because yeah. again, no social media. And it literally was everybody talking to one another. The the book sales just shot up in the air. And yeah. when it did, so up until then, it's not doing well. Nobody's paying attention. Let Tim do whatever the hell he wants. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Then the thing takes off and somebody very smart somewhere said, this thing is working. Don't anybody touch it. Yeah. Whatever we're doing, keep doing it exactly the same way. And again, nobody ever bothered me. So on... you didn't notice a difference as far as the process? No, it stay, it no. Stayed nobody the same. got uptight. There weren't more people all of a sudden asking me to do more or yeah. I needed to answer to more people. None of that. It was That's all awesome. the same. So to me, I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I didn't know that the series was doing well. I didn't have any children in that age group. Right. Um, I was <laughs> sitting alone at my desk. I knew it was going okay because people were, you know, you could see people were happy and they're going, no, no, this is going good. No, this is good. This is good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't until I could, I can't tell you what book it was, but I went to a friend's house for dinner and he had kids who yep. were that age group and the other uh, couples who were there had kids and all the kids were downstairs in the basement and they're going, hey, so what have you been doing? Oh, you know, Tim's a, a book artist and, yeah, working on anything that, you know, interesting. I was like, ah, I'm working on this kid series called Goosebumps. And it was like, you know, all of a sudden, er, everything stopped and they're like. Jaws dropping. Got right. yeah. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. And they called the kids up from the basement and they all got their books. And it was like, oh. That's oh, awesome. Wow. This is kind of cool. This well, is there a, it is. This is a big deal. Yeah. Well, because again, like people, like you, if if it was R.L. Stein, you know, because his name's plastered all over it. Like you have to go in the side. I think the inside cover is where you're credited, and then of course you've got your signature on the book. So like, if you're not looking at that, then you're not necessarily knowing who it is. So you almost have that kind of anonymity, which I, I think is kind of cool too, because you oh, have yeah. this. No, that's, you know what I mean. No, that's that's the way. You know, I it. it it's fun and it's cool now that people are starting to know my name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 30 years after the fact, but <laughs> right. that was never the point. The point wasn't, I, I never wanted you to look at that and, and think, Tim, I wanted right. you to think, Ooh, what the hell's going on in that picture? Yeah. I want to pick up that book, you know, that book and see what's going on inside. Yep. So as far as the cover goes, did you have any say in like the logo or the coloring of, of like the actual, like the no, Goosebumps but, logo or that was someone else? What was great is, you know, the book designers, you know, they saw that I was pulling out all the stops in the color saturation and then the secondary colors. You know, I made sure that I had a lot going on in 
the art itself. Yeah. And then, then when they saw that I was doing all that, they're like, we're going to do the same thing. And then they would take, you know, that drippy frame that yep. was around it and they would pull colors out of the art to make sure that matched. Then the logo would be complementary to that and they would add the colors to that. So they were working with my artwork directly color wise to get everything yep. to, to, to hook up. No, I didn't help. I didn't help develop the uh, logo. I know the logo was a quick sketch by somebody early on. To, okay. And they then were going, you know, we want something like this. We want something like this. And they farmed it around and then they ended up going, well, this is, this is what we want. Let's, there it is. It's already done. So, yeah. uh, you know, what started as kind of a throwaway ended up being the, the actual art. Gotcha. Okay. Now, Let's let's fast forward a couple of years. It's a popular book series. They say, hey, we're going to make a television show out of this, right? Very popular series. I'll say my biggest disappointment in the show was that a lot of the stuff that they showed on the, on the TV did not match the artwork on the books. And so I think a lot of kids were kind of pissed off about that. Like, I remember when I first watched uh, The Haunted Mask, which is one of my favorite stories, uh, primarily because that cover art is so iconic. And I saw this mask and I said, what? the hell is this this is not the thing that's on the cover like did you have any involvement with the show at all or was that totally a it's totally separate at that point now my involvement was the same as your involvement i was just yeah. watching it, just like everybody <laughs> else tuning in to go are yeah. they using my art or are they not using my art yeah I, all i know is that they had a very very limited budget and yeah. there were times where they were super true to what i did and yep the characters in there really looked like what I had created on the cover. And then, yep. you know, when, I don't know, Shocker on Shock Street comes along and that's a mechanical praying mantis, there's no right. budget for a mechanical praying <laughs> mantis. So we got to no. do something completely different. And yeah. from my point of view, that was mo the more interesting twist was, yeah. I get it. I know what you guys are up against. I can, you know, make an arts easy. I can make whatever I want in a two dimensional space. Oh yeah. It doesn't co it's the same amount of money to me. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. the same eight dollars a pay. That's and, right. Uh, so you guys got the hard job here. And uh, you know, I I loved seeing the alternates to go, all right, well, I didn't yeah. see that coming, but I get it and have at it. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Is there any excuse for making slap? <laughs> Listen, because this is a soapbox I'm happy to jump on here. Is there any excuse why they had to make Slappy the Dummy look like Blanche from yeah, that, Golden Girls and, and made I, out of, I, like, breakable porcelain? Like, what the dude? That's I, not a hard thing to recreate. I, I, I don't know. That one I don't know because yeah. that, that seemed to yeah I I will I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna stay with you on that I don't know why he had red hair I don't know yeah. why he had to be different uh, swing and a miss thing I man could think of was when they 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 ordered the dummy and when it got yeah. delivered it was like shit that's not the one we wanted but that's the one we're using so. <laughs> <laughs> oh well that would remind me of i don't know if you're like a horror movie fan but like halloween four, michael myers the mask they ordered was not the mask that they were supposed to use and so that's why it looks like shit yeah. in the movie if you ever yeah, you know I, so I, listen there are plenty of times where that works out perfectly yeah. great and yep. uh you know that the, the uh, thank god the uh the the shark and jaws didn't work or yeah. else it would have become a hokey movie because we would have yeah. seen it too much. You would have seen it too much, and that's the whole idea is that you don't see it, and it's the suspense. So, but but I agree. I think there were definitely instances, for example, um, and I, I know you have a fun story about this, but say cheese and die. I thought the the episode was very well done because you had the kind of the skeletons in there, which is an iconic photo. Um, but I I read this fun fact, but I want you to reveal it. Tell me about the cover and how it relates to the story itself. So. Uh, this is a story that I didn't hear until, uh, you know, uh, three, four, five years ago when RL and I were out, uh, speaking together. Yeah. And, uh, so again, you know, the deal was I would get the short synopsis about the story, say cheese and die was one of the earlier ones, but it was also one of the ones where soon as I read the title, and I got the short synopsis, I was like, oh, I get it. There's, you know, there's a there's a certain amount of, you know, tongue in cheek about this stuff, too. There's a little humor in yeah. all the Goosebumps stuff. So 
I knew that we could lighten up a little bit. It didn't have to be, you know, heavy horror. It's horror, but anytime you can be a little bit, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, let's, 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 let, let, let's let it rip. So yeah. say tease and die. I went, Oh, I get it. This is going to be fun. So I make the Polaroid picture looking thing. Cause it's about a camera that when you had, Got a picture taken, bad things would happen. Yep. So I was like, oh, yeah, well, maybe, you know, if somebody say cheese and die, uh, let's have, you know, a typical family, uh, you know, at a barbecue, then there's a picture being taken, but they're all skeletons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, yeah, follow through on that one. So I paint it up, and, and it's one of the pieces that I really like. And I'm going, yeah, all right, this is good. We're hitting the groove here. I understand what the author wants. Now, behind the scenes, what I don't know is, so R.L. never saw any of the sketches. He would never have any say in what, you know, what sketch was chosen. I always did three sketches for every Goosebumps cover. And okay. he never was part of that development. This is before you started actually painting it, though. This yeah, is like three right, like right. concepts. So I would submit three pencil sketches. People would choose. Sometimes they'd say, ooh, we like the background in sketch number three. Can you use the character in number one and use the background in three? You know, but most of the time it was like one, two, three. We like three. We like two. You know, yeah. go with that one. So he never was part of the decision making. They would wait till I got finished with the art and then they would ship it over to him and he would see the actual painting complete. But yep. it was oh, and he was well on his way in his stories. You know, uh, yeah. so, you know, I'm I'm sure he was better than halfway done most of the time. He might have been three quarters of the way done when he would finally see the artwork. Yeah. And uh, so they shipped that one over to him and uh, he looked at it and he was like, yeah, that's uh, it's cool. But uh, there's no this doesn't happen in my story. There's no, <laughs> there's no family of skeletons barbecuing in this story anywhere. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know. This is, I, I, you know, I'm not sure what we're going to do here. And uh, <laughs> they said to him, they said, well, Bob, uh, we're not going to ask Tim to repaint it. Cause that's a whole lot harder. So yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to write something in there and figure out where this goes. But before the story's over, we're going to need a family barbecue, a family of skeletons barbecuing in that story. And there it is. So he had to go back, and he always, and he rolls his eyes when he says it. He goes, yeah, and then I had to write in the dream sequence. <laughs> yes, where the, the family of, uh, of, you know, skeletons show up. And it was so funny because for the longest time, it was one of my – favorite pieces and i thought i did such a good job of it and now when i'm out with bob it's one of the stories he tells where it's the ones that he likes the least and i was like <laughs> ah, ah, i thought this was a good one so does he you know now because obviously you guys have met up now face to face you've got you know, some kind of a friendship going i oh, guess absolutely but, yeah yeah absolutely yeah I love so it. what what has he said that is his favorite artwork that you've done for one of his books does he have a favorite that he's mentioned uh, I, I, I've heard him uh, mention, uh, he likes the haunted mask. Yep. So that was a piece that, you know, he thought illustrated well, what he was, uh, trying to convey in the story. Um, um, I, I, I know there's other ones too, but that's one that I, I remember vividly him saying. Okay. And then obviously you're not, you were not the demographic for, for these <laughs> books. Did you ever read any of them? I had to go back and read them. So you did. That's okay. A, that's a good story because, well, uh, so Goosebumps becomes popular enough and then you get reached out to from the local uh, elementary school or middle school saying, oh, we, we hear you that you're the Goosebumps artist. Will you come and talk to the kids? Yeah. Or, you, or, you know, or the library would invite you to come and you'd speak to the kids and I, you know, that wasn't my thing at the beginning. I was I was horrified about speaking in public, even though they were kids. Yeah. I just, you know, the whole idea of getting up and speaking, I'd rather go to the dentist than, <laughs> than do that. Um, yeah. So I started to do it, and then I started getting quizzed. You know, it was like, oh, well, what's your favorite cover? And I would pick, you know, whatever one I picked. Yeah. And then they'd go, but what's your favorite story? And I remember going, oh, 
I didn't read any of them at this point. And I was like, you better go back and read a couple, dude. And you better be able to pull one out of your pocket. Oh, and yeah. So I started to go back and read a few of them. Nice. And I just went back and reread one recently. And uh, you're right. I'm not the demographic, but they're written so well. They're and, fun stories. Yeah. And just the whole structure of short chapters. You get to the end and there's always a hook and the hook yep. makes you go, oh, all right. How long's the next chapter? Oh, it's only 10 pages. I'm going to read another <laughs> chapter. And all yes. of a sudden you cook through half the book and you're all, you know, now you're hooked and you go all the way through it. So it was just structured in a way that kept you engaged and kept you want to read. And the cool part about every one of the, the stories, there was always some sort of cool ending. And I never yep. knew what it was, so I could never tip the hand and wreck it and yeah. give you too much information on the cover. Well, that's I was going to say. He never gave you the ending of the book. He would just give you this a brief synopsis. Yeah, no, to get I, you, I never yeah. knew, never knew what 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 the twist was going to be. Yeah, no, we we actually did an episode, a follow up to the Goosebumps one, where my guest uh, he he put together his top ten twists. And yeah. funnily enough, I think "Be Careful What You Wish For" was number one, which I think you mentioned that was not you. The the, the original artwork for "Be Careful What You Wish For" was was another artist. Yes. So okay, nice man. So all right kind of wrapping things up here um a couple things one as an artist um what's some advice if there are any digital artists listening or even traditional artists listening to this podcast if you could give any advice to them at this point they're wanting to make this their career or at least maybe a nice profitable side gig i mean what's what's the main thing you want them to focus on to do that uh i've mentioned this a couple times so um a lot of the how-to stuff that uh, I did back, you know, in the late seventies and, um, uh, you know, early eighties, none of that information applies anymore. The world's a yeah. different place. Um, even, you know, even how you make art, the whole thing, how you, how you present it to people, all that stuff. It's all obsolete. All that information's yeah. unimportant. What is important is how you go about what you're doing now you got to start looking at the, you know if you're serious about this you've got to take this stuff on the same way you t would take on your uh your health or going to the gym or if you were training to be in the olympics this stuff has to become a fully engaged part of your everyday life and yep. you have to then go all right yeah i have a job and yes i have to take care of other things in my life but every night or every other night from 7 30 until 9 i do my art and it is yeah. non-negotiable i am doing this here and you're putting those hours in and come the end of the week you now can chart it and go i put in 20 hours of work and you are 20 hours of work better and it's putting in the time and putting in the time consistently that's going to make you better and you're going to get more enjoyment out of it as you progress because a lot of people don't put enough effort into it and they kind of plateau and they start to lose interest and and this isn't even saying that you're going to make this your job and that the goal is that you do this for your job because I know a lot of people, I'll give you two sides of it. So I do this all the time. I've been doing it forever. And I'm going back to that baseball scenario where, you know, there is a time where, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm sick of it. You know, yeah. I, I, I've been doing it, been doing the same thing over and over again for too much time. I need to go do something else and clear my head. Yeah. I know some other people who have really great jobs and it, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't thrill them, but they make money at it but it buys them the time to go do their art on the side and their art is their escape from everything else. And they get maybe more enjoyment out of it and they're putting in the time and they're getting better at it. And so it's, again, the goal isn't, Oh, I'm going to get rich at this. It, the goal is making it part of your life and getting that enjoyment out of it because the same 
thrill that I got, um, you know, back when I was, you know, just starting where you're coming up with an idea and you start to draw the sketch and all of a sudden it starts to click and you go, ooh, I got something here. Yeah. And it starts to take hold. That's still, that's, that same thing still gets me excited now. All these years later, it's still the same fun thing. And then as I'm g doing the artwork and we're getting close to finishing it up, I'm still excited. And there's still a, you know, there's still a fist pump still in there at the, at the end of it. And uh, uh, that's what it's all about is the, you know, the excitement. Yeah. Well, there it is, man. Um, so as an artist... Um, and I feel like I should have asked this question first because you just gave a fantastic segue to wrap this show up because that was emotional and it was deep. And then, oh, man, I might even swap these around. I don't even know. But <laughs> as an artist, I know from what I've heard, there's like certain things that people either just suck at drawing or they hate to draw because it just it drives them nuts to do it. Like I know a, a friend of mine does art and he hates drawing hands like it's the worst thing for him to draw a pair of <laughs> hands. Right. Deal. As well, that's what, I was, that's what I was going to say. Is there anything about art when you're doing it regardless? Like, is there something that you're like, shit, I don't want to draw that, or that's really annoying, or like, hey, I don't want to see an elbow, so I'm going to put a long sleeve shirt on this person. Like, is there anything like that that, like, you have, like, a, a personal, like, vendetta against when it comes to drawing or, or, well, or painting? No, the, the thing I have, the, the, the thing that drives me nuts is when, like, we all went through it. Drawing hands is hard. Yeah. And the only way to get better at it is don't shy away from it. Get yep. those hands out there. Get a lot of emotion in the in the poses of the hands. Make them prominent and work at it. The thing that I hated the most, and I was guilty of it, is uh, I'm putting his hands in his pockets, <laughs> or I'm putting his hands behind his back, or yeah. I'm hiding his hands. Can't yeah. do that. You can't do that because yeah. you can do it, and it's a and it you can escape it. But every time you look at it, you're gonna go, eh, I chickened Sh out. Should have put hands out. in. Exactly. Yeah. Well, like, I, and I'm thinking of the haunted mask where she's holding the mask. You see a couple of fingers. That's about it, though. Was that was that purposefully done to avoid hands, or that just no, happened well, to be the vision? With you that had? one, I wanted a, a single image, totally dominant. I wanted it. You know, the 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 part of what's going on in the story is she can't get it off. So I needed to have her hands on there on gotcha. the mask, but the mask needed to be all your attention. Yeah. All your attention is on that. I didn't want you to go, uh, oh, I can see part of that girl's face. And, you know, does she, you know, does she have blue? Eyes? Like, that's not important. It's right. the mask, the mask, the mask. So Gotcha. Okay. Um, so uh, as far as, let's let's talk pipe dreams for a second here. If you could be asked to illustrate or re-illustrate a, a book series or a comic book, whatever, what's like, What's what's your what's your white whale? What's something that you've always wanted to draw for that you have not done yet? But if they asked you, you would do it in a heartbeat. Um, early, so I, I got so I, I I've gotten to do so much over gotten nice word. I got a <laughs> chance to do so many things uh, all along the way. When I so I'm I graduated high school in. 1977. I went to art school, took a year off, went to art school in 78, 79. And at the time, there was nothing bigger than Stephen King and Frank Frazetta. Yep. You know, Stephen King is an author, Frank Frazetta as, uh, as an artist. And while we're all in art school, you know, while you're shooting your mouth off, well, I want to do a Stephen King cover. I want to do a Stephen King cover. Yeah. Now, I got to do the horror stuff with Goosebumps. I got to do tons of it. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I'm i good. I'm good. And okay. In the uh, – I then later on in my career, they, uh, they repackaged uh, three Stephen King uh, books, um, The Shining um, – Salem's Lot and I forget the third. Pet say Pet Cemetery. All yeah. in a nice big hardback volume. Really beautiful okay. looking book. And they yeah. said, oh, hey, Jacobus, you get a chance to do the cover for this and we want it to be The Shining. And I was like, holy smokes. Yeah. This is what I want to do. So came up with a design and it's, you know, 
the Jack Nicholson character standing outside the, the mansion. It's snowing out and yep. he's got his hands out to his sides and there's blood on his hands. So you have okay. the darkness of all the white and yep. the blood on his hands. So when I did the pencil sketches, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I, I drew it, and he, but you can't tell that it's blood. So I was well, black and white. Out, yeah. So I got out the paint and I painted on the the sketch. So it's a pencil yeah. sketch with big red hands on there. And I turned it in and they were like, oh, man, that's perfect. That's what we want. And I said, all right. So when I do this, you know, you want the goosebumps colors. They're like, no, 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 no. This is what we want. We want a black and white image. And the only color that's going to be there is in his hands. And I was like, holy shit, this is going to be good. Yeah. So we did it. So whenever I put a, a human figure in my paintings, I always take some photo reference just so yep. you get that realistic thing. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stuff that I did, especially even in the goosebump stuff where I can do them without, but it takes on a little more cartoonish feel when okay. you use a good photo reference you start to lean much more realistic there's those subtle lighting things that happen that you think you can do on your own but you go "Ooh, that's you need nice. a reference that's... photo really makes a difference yeah. so yep. usually it would be a, a you know friend a family member somebody but uh in this one i was like uh, -uh. it's gonna be me so nice it's one of the very few pieces that i ever posed for myself but not only did I get to paint the Stephen King cover, I got on the Stephen King cover. So oh, I love that it. was that was as good of a home run ball as I was ever going to get. And uh, so, yeah, I got uh, I've got the chance to to do uh, almost anything. I, I I don't have anything where I'm going. Oh, I know I could do such a cool spin on, you know, you know. Halloween, you know, like, yeah, sure. It, it, I don't know. I could do it and it would, it, it would be fine, but I don't know if I would bring any super spark to it. So I don't have that yeah. one where I, I, in my head, I go, I can make this better. I could make it. I could make it, but I don't know if I'm making, you know, back to what sure. we said all the way at the beginning where you're trying to work with a property that already has a history to it. And am I bringing, am I going to bring something special? I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's great, man. Um, well, listen, Tim, th thank you so much. I I really appreciate you coming on here. I, I do have to tell you something real quick. So I told my I was talking to my mom on the phone today. And I said, Ma, guess what? She goes, what? I said, you remember those books I used to read, Goosebumps books? She goes, yeah, you love those books. Said, yeah, I did. I loved them. Uh, I am interviewing the illustrator of those books. And she goes, wow. You know what she said to me next? <laughs> do you think you could get Stephen King? <laughs> I swear to God, hand on my chest. That's what she asked me. I said, Ma, I mean, I'll, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. No, no, no promises. So <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh man, dude. Uh, again, thank you for coming and hanging out with me today, man. I really I appreciate, appreciate it. you reaching out. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, listen, that's going to wrap up another episode of the Generation S podcast. I want to thank Tim Jacobus for coming on as our very, very special guest. I give a lot of people the very special guest title, so you get two varies, Tim. I just want you to know that. And that <laughs> means something it. as far as, yeah, man, absolutely. So, guys, thank you so much for listening and uh, watching in this case because this is going to be up on our YouTube channel. So uh, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.